I've always been intimidated by the material world, especially the kind of stuff associated with tools and industrial processes. I'm much more at home in the realm of mathematical equations and computer programming code. I know it's a bit strange for a guy who grew up near Pittsburgh to be like this, but what can I do? My brother suggested that perhaps a little counterphobia would help, and it introduced me to his friend, the blacksmith. My name is Jim Hoffman. I've been a blacksmith full-time for about 27 years or so, part-time for two and a half, three years on top of that. I'm originally from central Ohio. I got interested in this stuff from historical reenacting and volunteering at a museum in Ohio called Ohio Village. Volunteered there in a blacksmith shop and a gun shop and then went to school in West Virginia for a museum program. And one thing led to another and I got involved in full-time iron work. My specialty is museum quality reproductions and I get to play around and do some art stuff every once in a while too. The basic of it is heating metal up and shaping it with a hammer. As I say, heat it and beat it. It's astonishing the variety of things that Jim can make by heating and beating metal. Anything from uh, nails, uh, most of the architectural hardware that I make, I, I make all the hardware that's necessary to mount it. Small butterfly hinges to big gate hinges for forts and restorations and places like that. Cooking utensils, fireplace shovels and pokers, band irons, toasters, frying pans, I make the pans and everything. Lighting devices, chandeliers, and tools, axes. I even make my own hammers and most of my own tools I make myself, which is quite the tradition amongst blacksmiths up until Probably the 20th century, the blacksmiths were the ones that you would rely almost solely on for tools. The surgical tools I did were for reenactors doing Revolutionary War surgeon impressions. I actually learned more than I care to repeat about 18th century surgeries. Most of those tools were primarily dealing with amputations and ball extractions, musket ball extractions. Not so. testicles. <laughs> Correct, not testicles. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I suppose they'd remove them if they needed to be, but it's a, it's a bloody job, and so. My intention was to get into making muzzle-loading guns, and I got distracted when I went to school for the museum program at Salem College. They had, a, at that time, they called the program Heritage Arts, and there was a blacksmith that was there, and that's where the bug bit me for iron work. He and I got along very well personally, as well as I enjoyed working with him and the kinds of things he was making at the site. There is a tradition of blacksmiths mentoring others. Jim's mentor had originally been trained by another smith, and Jim ended up learning from this man as well. The uh, first instructor I had was Paul Browning. Uh, the second one was Tom Goodson. If I had problems, he'd help me out. I had my own shop at my parents' house. It was actually a small one-stall garage, and friends jokingly called it the forging closet. There were other smiths around that if I had problems, they would help me out, early mentors. And I've also taken classes from Peter Ross, who was the master at Colonial Williamsburg for about 20 some years. He's been a big support and mentor. And the guys that work down there now are a wealth of information. And if, if I have any problems, they're willing to help out. Ken Schwartz is now the current master. There's a lot of network of Smiths that if somebody wants to get involved in it, which is one of the reasons why I teach classes as well, is just another way to pass on. If it hadn't been for other people passing the information to me, I wouldn't be as, as far as I am. 
but as I've told other people in the years past when they asked me how I learned and talk about taking some classes and workshops, I set up my own shop and I beat my brains out. Most of the welding I do in my shop is called forge welding. A lot of people in the British Isles refer to it as fire welding. When Jim needs to join two metal surfaces, he heats them up and then applies what he calls a flux, which is a white powder made out of anhydrous borax and boric acid. It's very difficult to weld it without a good flux. That keeps the scale from forming up. When the air hits the metal, scale forms. If you see any things falling off the metal while I'm pounding it, it's normally scale. The air hits the metal, it oxidizes it, and actually is rust coating, and it pops loose as I'm hammering it. That will interfere with a forge weld. So the flux lowers the melting temperature of it and enables me to get a clean weld where in some cases you it's very difficult to see it. Where is the welder? Right right here is where the weld is on the back side. This is a small strap hinge. Jim builds his forges out of old propane tanks and lines them with a ceramic blanket material that is so good at insulating from heat that he can touch it with his bare fingers. Since he's on his feet all day, he came up with a pretty ingenious type of footwear, wooden clogs with horseshoes nailed to the bottom. I wondered how a nice Ohio boy like Jim would end up in a Pennsylvania mill town like Ambridge. <laughs> Oh, how I ended up in Ambridge, Pennsylvania. Um, basically, to make a long story short, is marriage. And I found it was very difficult to get a Pittsburgh girl out of Pittsburgh, and I understand why. As I was getting desperate to find a place to locate the shop, I just happened to see a sign on a billboard for uh, the Ambridge Regional Center, which is a former Armco steel plant, it was turned into an industrial park uh, when Armco closed out in the early 1980s. And that's how I ended up where I am. It's a tough business to get into, but I started by providing reenactors, mostly Revolutionary War reenactors, with things they need for the camps and the campfires, and started doing some craft shows. Really early on, I started picking up work for museums that need hardware for their reconstructed buildings, sometimes restoration work. The first fort that I did the hardware for was a frontier fort in Lawton, Oklahoma, Museum of the Great Plains. I've done some other work for smaller forts. One of the jobs that I had intermittently in my career as a smith was at Old Fort Niagara as the interpretive programs manager there, running all the historical programs. Fort Ligonier is my largest client to date, and they kept me busy, really, really busy for about 10 years. And I continue to do work for other museums uh, around the country. It was hard not to have kind of vague religious dread looking at all those fiery furnaces. As much fun as it was to visit Jim's Forge, I still felt intimidated by the material world. Furthermore, I had developed misgivings about the next place I may be headed. Do you believe in hell? Oh, yes. Do you equate it with being in one of your forges? Never thought about it that way, but no, I, I definitely believe in hell. Really? Oh, there's a heaven and a hell. Okay, so hell's not just some kind of... Make-believe place? No. Uh-oh, I better I, mend my way. Yeah, torment. I believe in uh, eternal torment from separation from God. And does it involve burning in a furnace? Don't know. I don't want to find out. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not the only sinner. Just as I was leaving, Jim made a confession about the nature of those who are drawn to the blacksmithing life. Most blacksmiths are just pyros, pyromaniacs, making a living. Playing with fire, huh? That's right. There's something about the fascination of fire. It still fascinates me to see hot metal move.